Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to have you here today, and I want to thank you for joining us for session two of the Digital Marketing Webinar Series. My name is Jeff Nepper. I'm the Executive Director of Sales here at Canary Labs, a software firm that offers a data historian and trending software solution for the control and automation industry. If you missed last month's session or want to review any of this session later on, please visit our blog to find recordings of the webinar as well as the PowerPoint presentation. This second session is going to quickly review a few points from the previous session and then cover the subject of blogging. Throughout the webinar, please send any questions you may have. I will either answer them as we go or might save them for the end. But I do want to make sure I value your time and get as many answers answered for you as possible. So please feel free to ask anything on your mind. All right, let's get started. As you probably remember from last time, there are six main components to a well-balanced digital marketing campaign, and these are all centered around one thing, your website. The general goal of all six categories is to increase traffic to your website and drive more sales leads. Therefore, you need to have an effective website that has a strong likelihood of lead conversion. Based on our first action idea from last session, how many of you audited your website? Take a quick second if you would. And let's take a poll and answer that polling question. Do you feel that your website needs to be reworked in order to better present your business and capture more web leads? All right, thank you very much. Now, as I've mentioned before, if this is anything at all that you need help with, please let me know. Uh, I have a great firm that I can recommend that does complete website packages that are SEO optimized, and that starts at only $3,500. All right, let's quickly review what we discussed last session, the organic search category. Organic search dealt with the order in which web pages appear on search engine result pages after a keyword search is done. The higher your placement, the more likely you are to win the web traffic. In fact, we learned that nearly 92% of all web traffic gets directed to one of the 10 pages on the first page of a search result. So if you're not on page one, you theoretically don't exist online. We also discussed the difference between general keywords and specific long tail keywords. We looked at examples of the results for the keywords control system integrators, control system integrators in Texas, and then finally this search, pipeline engineering and system integrators in Houston, Texas. We spoke about how important it is to ensure we are present for these types of detailed or long-tailed keyword searches. And if you remember, I told you that high placement does not happen by accident. And as you all know, that's why you're here today, it has to be worked at. Well, we talked about a five-step strategy. We first spoke about auditing your website, and we also talked about defining your keyword list. Uh, step three was to check your current performance for your top three or five keywords. I showed you a free tool that could be found at seocentro.com that you could use to accomplish this. Hopefully, you've checked your ranking on the three to five keywords you established as most important. If you've not done so yet, please, please, please make sure you do this before you continue into blogging. As in most things, measuring your results are key to learning what's working and what doesn't. We talked about step four, which is to focus on search engine optimization, SEO. And SEO is the process of customizing your site architecture and content to appeal to both the human reader as well as the search engine algorithms of Google, Bing, or Yahoo. We also learned that SEO has two basic parts, on-page and off-page. On-page focused on what our site content contains, the framework or the site architecture that it's built upon. Off-page SEO focused more on proving your industry relevance and experience. This is done based on how other established industry sites and community members interact with your site. We discussed how important backlinks are 
and it was recommended you spend time on sites like the CSIA Exchange, Control.com, Automation World, Mr. PLC, and any other industry relevant sites linking material back to your site when possible. Again, don't miss out on CSIA Exchange. This is a great way to post relevant information and link back to your site. And we also discussed that blogging would help develop content-rich pages that offered others information about your business as well as focus on specific keywords that you want to rank higher for. And finally, we discussed how important it is to build a team and regularly begin to meet to execute these and other upcoming strategies. All right, so that's it. A quick wrap-up of where we were last time. Now let's discuss the session subject for today, blogging for your business. So why should you blog? Simple, to increase your web traffic. However, successfully blogging and increasing your organic search is not so easy. You have to strategically shape your content so that you can reach those desired results. That means your content has to serve several purposes, and those include they have to rank high for your targeted keywords. You need to offer solutions to people's problems have a likelihood of being shared throughout the industry and be bookmarked by your end user. Now, this can be difficult to do and it doesn't just happen on its own. To achieve blog success, we have to learn to blog with both purpose as well as strategy. Before we can do that though, let's make sure everyone has a good understanding of what a blog looks like, where to set one up, and how to navigate within one. So what is it? A blog is a collection of web logs, or articles providing helpful, valuable, and educational content to draw and attract visitors. Uh, better yet, blog could stand for better listings on Google. A blog is great for businesses because it allows for a company to attract not just general web traffic, but dialed in specific and qualified web traffic. These qualified visitors who are actively seeking information with a problem in mind are more likely to turn into leads or customers, especially if you demonstrate you can help solve those problems. Now that's a key, remember, we are problem solvers, so when we blog, we want to present solutions. At its heart, a blog is simply a series of interlinked web pages that are generally designed to be updated and added to. A blog is typically run by an individual or small group and is written in an informal, or conversational style. A blog sits on a hosted web server. It can be a free or a paid service depending on the provider. There are many companies that offer blog hosting. We're going to look at a list of three and I'd recommend that you choose one. The three we'll look at would be blogger.com, wordpress.com, and weebly.com. Of these three, I would highly recommend blogger.com. Here's why. Blogger is owned by Google. It's free to use, it's extremely easy to set up, and it's a tool that I use, so as I cover it, it'll start to feel familiar. As you can see, it's really as simple as a one, two, three step with Blogger. You create your account. You'll need to have a Google account. If you don't, it's free, it can be created at Google's main web. Then you name your blog. I recommend something super simple. For instance, our blog is named Canary Labs Blog. It will then ask you to link a domain. A best practice with Blogger is to name your new domain with a blog dot your current website format. So for us, blog.canarylabs.com. You will need to speak with your webmaster and network admin in order to execute this step. Finally, just choose your template. I would choose something very simple and plain. You can then customize the color profile to match your website. The idea is, new, is to incorporate your blog into your website essentially wrapping it with your site. For example, look at the Canary Labs blog. As you can see, it's incorporated into our existing page with our page header at the top as well as our typical page footer at the bottom. When we shift from our blog to our regular site, it feels relatively seamless. The user doesn't feel like they're visiting two different sites. And that's the general idea. You want to make sure that the overall feel and functionality of your website gets matched on your blog. Well, let's briefly, we'll discuss the way a blog's ordered or the layout. The main page of a blog features all the blog posts 
and they're sorted by post date with the most recent post at the top. There's also a list of categories that fits on either the left or the right, and those categories represent the labels that you choose to associate each of your blog posts with. This is a great way to sort your content. It also offers a good bit of variety. That way you can essentially allow your people to dig deeper into your blog. So for instance, we currently have eight separate categories, and they range from product content to digital marketing, even a section called life that we use for travel posts and other non-work specific type of writing, how we volunteer in the community, uh, what our staff's up to, things of that nature. If you so choose, you can also have navigation on the side that includes posts by date as well as by author. These later two are less relevant for us than we chose to omit them. So that is what your audience will see. Let's see what the pages look like that you actually use to create and publish your blog. Here's a look at our main content page. As an author or an admin, this is the main page you'll actually work from. So similar to the blog, you can see that my previous work is saved chronologically. And you can also see that I have two posts at the top that are currently in draft status. A nice feature of blogging is that you can work on blog posts and save your content without publishing them to your blog. Until a post is published, the public cannot see your post. This is nice because it will allow you to take your time developing content, and it also allows you to treat your blog kind of like a brainstorm session. So as you have ideas, you can jot them down, you can put in bits at a time, you can work on them without fully committing to having them published for the general public to see. You can also see how each of your posts have been labeled. Each label is listed directly after the post. Blogger also incorporates some analytics into this page, showing you the number of times each page has been visited on the right. This is helpful to better understand user interactions, as well as determine what makes for good subject matter. As you can see, we've had a few posts in the last 30 days reach a fairly significant number of potential customers. When we select one of our posts, we are given the options to edit, view, delete, or share the post. And we'll look at the edit feature. As you can see, this blog post editing page looks very much like a Word or a Google Doc. There are a few exceptions, but overall it should feel very familiar to you. Once all the content has been created, you must publish your blog. Since this previously has been published, the orange button in the upper right-hand corner no longer says publish, but instead update. You do have the ability to unpublish a post, which is the next button, revert to draft. Below that, you will see the label section, and this is where you determine how to categorize the post. Also, please notice the formatting drop-down. It currently says normal. Later on, I'll reference how this tool can be used to create headings and subheadings, uh, very important for your SEO. One thing I should also note is in the top left-hand corner, you'll see where it says Compose or HTML. We're currently in the Compose feature. If we switched over to HTML, this is where you can do more custom coding. It is not necessary to know any HTML code to blog. It's only a nice feature if you do know HTML code. So now that we've covered a basic understanding of a blog's content, let's move on to the actual writing, the best practices, and some tips that you can take with you today. Okay, to best illustrate how to structure, let's just create a new blog post together, walking through the best practices as we go. First, I've determined that I want to increase the position of Canary for the keywords data historian software. Now, as you can see, I'm currently ranked in the 10th spot on the very bottom of the first page with Google. Not overall bad because we are on the 10th spot on the first page, but my goal inside of the next three months is to get us to the fifth spot on the first page. And then by the end of the year, my goal is to hopefully advance it another one or two spots. Before I begin blogging, I want to search for my keyword term and then move to the bottom of the page, which this graphic's already done. I'm looking for the section of the Google page labeled Searches Related to Data Historian Software. Now, this is neat because what Google has essentially given me is a list of words they consider to be important to the keyword I've already searched for, Data Historian Software. Now, these keywords that Google's laid out for me are called Latent Semantic Indexing Keywords. Just call them LSI for short, and they're right here. So you can see words like open source, definition, pi, 
family, review, Rockwell, personal. Whether it makes sense to me or not, Google has decided that when I search for data historian software, those words are also important. Now, I would write these down for all of my major keywords. They are important and will be used to let Google know that our page is important to the keyword you are trying to rank for. So for instance, in this example, because Pi and Rockwell are considered relevant to data historian software, it will actually benefit me to mention their names in my post. This is kind of a unconventional. Generally, you wouldn't list competition when you're writing about your company. But this triggers Google into better understanding that my post content is indeed about data historian software. And really, it makes sense, right? Besides my monitor, beside my monitor is a folded piece of uh, printer paper with the 25 most important keywords that I reference whenever I write. I try to pick three to five groups of keywords that I can comfortably work into my writing, and I focus on those. I also have a list of connected LSI words that I've identified by conducting multiple keyword searches. I would encourage you to do something similar, keeping it close by whenever you create a blog post or website copy. I personally, I go back to this page every single day, and this is where I kind of start to develop my blogging strategy. It's really important before you start to write, you have that strategy. So let's look at a blog that I just created yesterday. As we dissect the strategy behind this post, let's follow these best practices. First, we'll focus on the title at the top of the page. The title of this post is A Guide to the Best Data Historian Software, A Review of the Canary Historian versus Rockwell Factory Talk and OSI Soft Pi. Now, I know that title seems long and it may not seem overly natural, but the creation of that title was very purposeful. First, as per our best practice list, it incorporates our keyword, Data Historian Software, into the beginning. Ideally, you want your keywords in the first three to five words. But keep in mind that Google does not count what they call stop words in that word count. So with stop words removed, and those are the us, does, of, and, the Google robot will actually read my blog title as Guide Best Data Historian Software Review Canary Historian versus Rockwell Factory Talk OSI Soft Pi. Now that title is an extremely strong example of industry relevance and should place very well organically. It's also full of modifiers. These are specific words that others use when conducting detailed web searches. For instance, in my title, guide, best, and versus are commonly used search modifiers. Other examples of search modifiers would be top 10, 2016, valuable, important, key, practical, helpful, favorite, and so on. These should be used to help match what someone is likely searching. For instance, if you were to search for a data historian, would you just type data historian, or would you type best data historian, fastest data historian, maybe cheapest data historian? And finally, we need to use what's called H1 and H2 tags in the HTML coding. And before I showed you how you could switch into the HTML mode of a blog, you don't need to do that, though, with Blogger. The nice thing about it is that this is done for you automatically whenever you label text as a headline or subheading. Remember, that was the drop-down toolbar that I said you could select your text and label it a heading or a subheading. So when you create your blog, all you have to do is highlight your text and then use the drop-down to designate that text as heading or subheading, and it will automatically code it with H1 and H2 tags. As we move down our best practices into the content section, it is important we incorporate both of our main keywords as well as our LSI keywords into the first 150 body words in our blog. As you can see, I have my main data historian software keyword in the title, the main heading, and then three times in the content inside the first 150 words. The LSI keywords Review, Rockwell, Pi, Personal, Family, and Definition also appear a total of nine times in my title, heading, and first 150 words. Now, I need to stress, it's important that you don't go into a practice called keyword stuffing. 
keyword stuffing essentially is when someone sacrifices good English and good writing style to just try to pack keywords in as tightly as possible. You don't want to do this. Google has built into their algorithms a search that will let it know when a page is purposely stuffing keywords and it will, instead of benefiting you, it will actually hurt your organic uh, ranking. Not to mention, your human users won't enjoy reading the content. If they don't read the content, they don't engage, you're defeating your own purpose. So don't go overboard with this. When you read any of the content in this blog post or other blog posts that we do, you'll see that they are, if you know what keywords you're looking for, you'll see that they're relevant and they're there, but it'll never feel contrived or, or forced. It's also important to link out to industry relevant pages. Since Pi and Rockwell are both LSI keywords, this is a strong indicator that Google values their sites. So throughout my blog, when I use their names as headings, I create hyperlinks to their pages. Again, this might seem crazy since they're competition, but I don't pretend that my end user doesn't know they exist. I'm sure they do. So instead, I'm going to benefit from linking to them, increasing my relevance. Now, it is important to note, I always select the open new window option when I link outside my page. I don't want someone to leave my page because they follow an outbound link permanently. Instead, open new window just opens a new window. When they're done with it, they'll close it and they're still on my page. But for inner page links, I like to link product pages or other relevant blog posts, and I'll do that in the same window. This helps keep the reader engaged and on the site. A good practice, though, is to limit this to outside the first 150 words. So essentially, we don't want to create any links inside of that first 150 word count. What you would do by doing that is create an artificially high bounce rate. So essentially, you'd have readers coming to the page, reading the first three or four sentences, and potentially leaving. And that'll hurt your rankings with Google. So instead, we keep those outside of the first 150 words. Uh, we don't create an artificially high bounce rate by redirecting readers off our page too quickly. Now it's the dwell rate or the time someone stays on your page that's really important to Google. The longer someone stays, the more relevant your page appears. So as a final content practice, write at least 1,500 words or more. That way, since Google looks at the average time spent on page rather than each individual's time on a page, there will be plenty of content for the engage reader causing them to spend more time on the page, and that'll balance out the readers that leave quickly. Finally, we want to include a lot of multimedia in our post. Since humans have the same eight-second attention span as a goldfish, pay attention. It is important that we are constantly giving our readers new material and visuals. Pictures, videos, and infographics are a great way to do this. When you use an image, make sure you take the time to fill out the alt text field. This can be found by clicking on the image and hitting properties. The alt text field is the description that Google will use to read the image. It should always include your keyword. Keep in mind this is how Google knows what images to display for keyword searches under the images tab. Finally, short two to three minute embedded videos are great for increasing dwell time, as are infographics. Anything you can do to increase dwell time will benefit your SEO. So let's see how my blog posts did. After I publish a blog, I like to take the URL and visit SEO Book to use their free keyword density tool. That link will be on the blog for the digital webinar series too, if you want to check it out later. As you can see from the results, I have a really strong density for my main keyword data historian software. I also have extremely strong frequency for my LSI keywords. Over time, this page should do very well to help boost my organic reach for the keyword data historian software. Continuing to write maybe two or three blog posts over the next three months, uh, also focusing on data historian software with different subject matter, linking it to other blog posts, linking it to industry pages, this will continue to advance me, and I should be able to get out of that tenth spot and up to the fifth, third, maybe even second or first spot by the end of the year. Okay, that brings us to the wrap-up for today. We've reserved the last few minutes to answer any questions you may have asked with, throughout the webinar. If you have one, please take the time, type it over, or raise your hand.
All right, one question. Um, any suggestions on finding material to write about? That's a great question. There's a couple things you could do. Um, I have a strategy. I don't remember where I read it, learned it, or heard it, but um, I call it the one-third rule. And it's this. 33% of the time, I write directly with the strategy of moving up my organic search results. So similar to the way that I set this blog up. I pick something I feel like I'm low in of my keywords, and I write with a purpose. Another third of the time, I try to address a problem that I've seen mentioned numerous times in forums or chat rooms. So for instance, if I would see someone in a forum trying to figure out uh, how to better visualize trends, that's something that I would, uh, that I would write about. Another 33% of the time, I'm going to write complimentary pieces to other industry publications. Um, on these, I'll link to the articles as well as attempt to share my post with the article's original audience or author. Hope that helps. Um, other questions. Uh, will we have access to this presentation after the webinar? Absolutely. The uh, Canary Labs blog will host this webinar as well as you'll find previous webinars. Um, the infographics such as the best practices for blogging will be there as well as links for um, the free tools that we use for digital marketing. Um, and then we had a question about how often do you recommend to post blogs? Okay, that's a great question. Now this is a trick answer. <laughs> it depends a lot on you, your team, and your manpower. So the one thing you do not want to do is post blogs just to post blogs. It can actually be extremely detrimental. Any time that you post, you have to follow this type of a strategy. So if you have the material, if you have the time, you have the people, and you have the strategy in place, post as often as is possible. And by often as possible, I mean three to four times a week. If you don't have the right people, you don't feel that you have enough material, shoot for once every other week. And in fact, you might find that the best practice to gather your team, we talked about it last time, getting the team together, you know, maybe if you're the if you're the boss or if not get the boss to throw in on a on a pizza for for the team at lunch once every two weeks and around the around the table just talk about hey what problems have you heard customers talk about um, what uh, what articles have you read uh, lately in fact you could make that admission to the event everybody has to bring a problem or an article and you just have an information sharing session and then that you'll be surprised how fast you get blog material from doing something like that. Uh, so, yeah, write as often as you can, as long as you have the right things to talk about. And then uh, another question came in. Would you recommend uh, the CEO of a small company, 10 to 15 employees, to post personally, and how much time should this person dedicate for blogging? Okay, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't worry about the size of the company at all, right? Because we are, we are dealing with a digital storefront. No one knows how big, how small. How, how good or how bad you are until they hit your website. So you can, you, can, you can really put your best foot forward no matter what size you are. And on the blog, I think having the CEO write would be an amazing thing. Now, it's important, very, very important, because the position that comes along with CEO of a company, that that blog be proofread, that it be grammatically correct, that it be well done. So, as a as a reader of a lot of blogs, I'll give a lot of leadway when a staff person is the is the author. But if I am reading the blog of a company and the CEO is writing, and it's not tight and polished and well done, I'm going to make references or inferences, I should say, about that company based on that. So if the CEO is doing it, that's great. If he has a passion to write, <clears throat> that's wonderful. And by that leadership example, I'd imagine one or two other people would step up. But if it's you as a CEO and you're the one writing, Take the time to have two or three people, not, not bobbing head yes men, but take the time to have two or three people read it before you post it and make sure it's great. And if, it's, if you're not the best person to do it, delegate. All right, so that's all the questions for today. Thank you so much. We will be back, I think, three Tuesdays from now. I'll send out invitations. And uh, I look forward to talking to you all again. Again, feel free to reach out to me, um, phone number email address, uh, anything we can do to help, we'd love to help. All right, thank you.